All right, welcome everyone. So I'm really excited to be here with you all. So let me just ask you, have any of you had an idea um, or a dream or something that you were able to bring to fruition? Well, that's what this is for me. Athletes Using Their Power started as a FaceTime call with my supervisor, Didi Merritt, where we just had these ideas that clicked, this synergy, um, where we were able to talk about how do we use our platform as leadership development and our mission to educate and empower student athletes during these times? What can we do? And from that, we were able to take an entire idea that started on the back of a piece of paper as I was eating breakfast and bring this platform to you all. So what that means is for myself, um, so to introduce myself, my name is Marissa Robinson and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And for me, my why really is to help others find and use their voice. And through this process of putting together athletes using their power, I've had a great support system that has empowered me to use my voice in the platform that I have. So these sessions are here to do the same thing for you, to educate you, to help you find your voice, and then empower you to use that voice. So what we're going to do over the course of today, and if you get to join us on any of the following sessions over the next four Sundays, is provide you with tools to want to address the difficult conversation. How do I start? What do I do? What do I do with this information that I'm going to use today? But then also encourage you to bring some of your teammates, your student athlete peers along with you. So know that this space is a brave space. We want you to be able to ask questions. We want you to be able to express what you're going through, get clarification, know that people around you are going through the same things and have the same questions that you have. All right, and I was joking with my team that on the way here, uh, I had a, this little nervousness, right? It's like, this is our game day. Now that we're retired, we're, we're NARPs, right? We're former student athletes. This is as close as we get to a game. So I had my playlist going, I had my music. I'm not gonna tell you all the songs that I was playing on there because you know, some are strictly for the locker room um, to get myself ready to go today. So most of the times before we get to a game, we get a little hand clap going. So if you all are ready to get started, let me see if you need a couple hand claps on the screen or through the Zoom actual features. All right, thank you. Okay, I see it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pass it over to Crystal Childs, who is a student athlete at Clemson to introduce our speakers for today. Um, thank you so much, Marissa, for letting me introduce them. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Childs. I play volleyball at Clemson. I'm going into my junior year, and I'm so excited to be here. When I saw the chance to register, I was like, oh, I have to do it. I want to see all these advocates throughout the NCAA and all these people as eager as I am to just have difficult conversations and just ready for change and finally have our voices heard to be more than just like an athlete. So. Um, I'm here to introduce our two speakers. We have Jeff O'Brien and Sable Lee. Jeff is a former football student athlete who for two decades has been committed to maximizing the leadership potential of high school, collegiate, and professional athletes with specific focus on social justice and personal growth and development. He is one of the nation's leading sport-based leadership development and social justice educators. He currently serves as vice president for the Institute for Sport and Social Justice. Sable Lee, who is someone I've been working with this summer, is a former softball student athlete who has served student athletes as both a coach and administrator. Her work is centered around providing education and programming for career, personal, and social development. Sable is a dedicated administrator who provides a safe space for everyone she interacts with. She currently serves as administrator director of student athlete and development at Clemson University. Sable is such a great mentor and I hope you guys are as obsessed with her as I am after all of this. I'm so eager to hear from Jeff O'Brien and Sable as well, and I look forward to learning throughout this session. Please join me with welcoming both Seth and Sable. Great, thanks so much, Crystal. Thank you, Marissa. We're really excited about being here with everybody tonight and, and can't wait to initiate this conversation. Uh, to get us started into this conversation tonight regarding addressing difficult conversations, we have this a quote from our Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And uh, what Tutu said here is a pretty famous quote. If you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. And so much of what we've seen here this summer and certainly the past five months has ha had to do with social justice and certainly social injustice and the need for all of us to step up. 
And most of us have felt this new challenge, right? Feeling, really feeling challenged to uh, step up and be accounted for in ways that we may not have ever been before. Um, and so the, the thing that's, that's coming clear is there is a challenge before us um, and we have a decision to make. How are we gonna choose to show up? And as people in the sports world, and for all of you as student athletes or coaches, the question becomes, how are you gonna use your platform? Um, and these are some of the th things that we wanna talk about. If I have this platform, how can I use it to address some of the social injustices that I'm seeing in the world? Um, th this is not easy, as if it was easy, everybody would do it. And so we'll talk a lot about using our courage and vulnerability as we get into these conversations. As we consider these past five months, we wanted to show you a few images that we've all seen um, and just pose a, a, a question for you. This is just from the past five months, but these types of images are not new. For all of our lifetimes, we've seen images like this. We've heard stories about incidents like this. So the question we have is, why, is that? why do we keep on seeing these type of images in our country, in our culture? And as you consider that type of a question, it really begs the second one from a leadership standpoint. What are we all individually and collectively prepared to do to make sure we stop seeing these type of images? Is this the moment calls for us to step up and try to make a difference? The question is, what are we willing to do to make a difference? And as we consider that, one of the things that we, we at the, certainly the Institute for Sport and Social Justice always feel uh, good about is our history as folks within athletic culture. So if you think about sport and the role sport has played in social justice historically, social ju sport has been at the forefront of social justice. And you see here's just a handful of folks historically that we feel like we kind of um, step and rise on their shoulders um, as the folks who really set the stage and helped us, help lead us and show us the way. Um, while these are historical figures, we, the, the great news we see now is this transcendent power of sport we see in evidence right now in social justice circles. Um, people serve, serving as servant leaders as they consider the role that sport can play. And so let's take a look at uh, some of these folks from, from uh, our contemporary world. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, here we can see some current uh, examples of protests. We see NASCAR, U.S. Women's National Team, Colin Kaepernick, uh, Maya Moore, and some other examples from the WNBA and NBA. Um, right now and today, tonight, we're going to be utilizing the chat a lot. So we're going to start it off right now. I want to hear what are some ways and some things that you have seen your student athlete peers raise their voice? So how have you seen your peers within your campus, um, your teammates, your team, your, your athletic department, even around the nation? What are some things that you've seen your student athlete peers do to raise their voice? Monica says town halls with administration. Andrew says social media posts. Yep, we have a lot of social media posts. We have SAC, we have protesting and using their voice. We've seen a lot of athletic departments and student athletes around the country do that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, social media participate in unlearning together. Anya, I believe that was. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, SAC. Huge advocate for SAC. That is the whole purpose for SAC is sharing our voice and using it for minority student athlete collectives. And as we think of some, some examples that have happened recently around the country, we've seen Pac-12 and the Big 10 and different conferences form unity groups. We've seen unity groups over COVID safety protocols. We've seen it's on us um, advocating for sexual assault. Believe the American Conference in the past has created powerful minds. We are seeing so many examples right now within your student athlete environment of using your voice in your platform. Um, I see a lot of examples, keep them coming and feel free to write some things down as you see examples in the chat. But as we continue this conversation tonight, and our topic, remember, is addressing difficult conversations. We have to start by talking with and about vulnerability. So when we think of vulnerability, I think of the queen, Brene Brown. And Brene Brown says vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. 
So as you look at this quote and you absorb vulnerability, how is vulnerability connected to leadership? How is vulnerability, this idea of showing up and not knowing what the outcome is, how is that connected to leadership? Doing the right thing when it's not very mainstream. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, everybody. Being honest, vulnerability and honesty, it's humanizing, that's powerful, thank you. Bravery, it makes you relatable. If a leader cannot be vulnerable and open, then they cannot create a connection and build trust. We're gonna get to that, Crystal, thank you. But when we talk about vulnerability, it's all about the acts of courage. And it's all about knowing that we have to show up even when we cannot guarantee the outcome. And also when our fear comes into play, we have to show up anyway. We can agree that vulnerability is very uncomfortable. That's why we're talking about it today, right? Um, and when Brene talks about vulnerability, she talks about it feels like we are taking off this mask and really feeling naked without knowing how everybody else um, responds. So it looks like 57% of us agree, 27 disagree, and 16% are unsure. So we can get, we, again, we can agree that a lot of these conversations and being vulnerable is very uncomfortable. Talking about racism issues, especially if, you're, if you've grown up in an area where that is not part of your experience, it can make us feel very vulnerable. Let's look at the screen here. Powerful vulnerability. A lot of times we do not see these two words together. We either see powerful or we see vulnerability. But when they both come together, magic can happen. So in the chat, I want you all to explain to me what this phrase means to you and why. What does powerful vulnerability mean to you? What grabs you? Brinton says being comfortable, but being uncomfortable, not being afraid of being vulnerable, thank you. The strength and honesty, absolutely. Nakedly being honest, thank you everyone. Having the courage to be honest, the courage to be vulnerable, thank you. Yes, it, this is powerful vulnerability is acknowledging your vulnerability. And it's also acknowledging that vulnerability is a leadership strength. And even in the spite of our biggest fears, we still have to show up in spite of them. Um, the, the other thing with vulnerability is the transparency between people and it's actually what builds trust within our teams, our culture and our environment. Um, and as you continue to think about vulnerability, how can this be an ally in talking with your coaches, administrators, and your teammates? How can vulnerability help you when you're talking to your coaches, administrators, and your teammates? Connecting on a new level, communicating more effectively, allows for true honesty, absolutely. Being self-aware, it opens the door to trust. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Create a safe space, yes. Thank you, everyone continue to share your thoughts as we move along. We're gonna really dive into how to have these courageous conversations and address these difficult conversations. Yeah, thanks, Abel. And, and one of the ways we wanna do that is, is considering courageous conversations itself. We wanna reference that for a minute as we consider this quote from Carrie Patterson. Um, this idea of people who are skilled at dialogue do their best to make it safe for everyone to add meaning to the shared pool. And the shared pool refers to the pool of dialogue. Even ideas that at first glance appear controversial, wrong, or at odds with their own beliefs. Now, obviously, they don't agree with every idea. They simply do their best to ensure that all ideas find their way into the open. What we want you to think about is this notion of being able to disagree with people without being disagreeable to maintain a modicum of respect with folks, even if you disagree um, really strongly with somebody. Um, this is how you're able to establish dialogue um, and how you really resolve conflict, um, or at least come to a better understanding. We wanted to think about this because what's gonna happen is as you take the courageous stand to stand up for something, stand up for ideals, stand up for injustice, or stand up against injustice, uh, not everybody is going to pat you on the back and say, great job. Uh, some folks are going to want to challenge you. In some, some ways, they may challenge you that, that are not exactly um, in, in a healthy manner. And you need to be prepared for that. How comfortable are you being challenged if you say or do something that is perceived by others as offensive? Uh, the idea of being challenged, especially as you're dealing with social justice or injustice topics, is gonna to be something we're gonna to have to make sure 
um, we're able to we're able to navigate. Very few of us, and thank you for the self awareness and honesty. Very few of us, four percent of us, feel very comfortable being challenged. Um, Forty four percent of us do feel comfortable at least being challenged, with this, which is a healthy number as well. Um, but then you see folks uh, find themselves in, in all five points of this Likert scale. And one of the things that we think it's important to, uh, to reinforce is our own self-awareness is important. Uh, because one of the, the initial reactions we have to being challenged around, especially around social justice, is uh, defensiveness. That I get defensive if you're going to challenge me because I'm not racist, I'm not homophobic, I'm not sexist. And we feel it's a label being attached to us that's permanent as opposed to a temporary condition by something we may have said or done that struck somebody in a certain way. Listening and sharing, collaborating, you know, try not to, to be the, the lone wolf on this one and make sure you're bringing a, a group with you. Asking questions, inviting people, yeah, brainstorming, staying focused, absolutely. Yeah, listening, caring. Um, Caring is a critical piece. I, mean, I always think of the, the quote, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Uh, constant conversation. Yeah, we can't expect to have one and then this is done. We're good. Um, we can move on from there, you know, type of thing. Yeah, feel free to keep these coming. These are great. Listening and acknowledging, acknowledging other people's opinions. The concept of being heard uh, sometimes can be underestimated, but we wanna make sure people understand that uh, this is a critical piece. Um, and as you think about this, there's a couple pieces we want to uh, reinforce is that, you know, as, as you're making choices around some of these courageous conversations and leadership, uh, you don't have to be an expert in, in any of these topics. You have to be committed to learning and growing and getting better. Uh, but you really have to show up with a sense of humanity and vulnerability uh, in order to, to make a difference. And as you consider that, let's take a look at uh, one aspect of showing up that's going to be really important, and it deals with this idea of trust and how you build trust among people. Um, executive leadership coach Justin Patton offers these four critical elements of trust, and he says the four critical elements are truth, transparency, tact, and togetherness. And with all of these things, you, you can have a very strong cornerstone of trust. So in the chat, I want to know which of these four elements is most important to you and why. Katie says transparency. We have a lot of truth. Yes, togetherness, tact. Truth, it's always important to be honest. Thank you. Yeah, togetherness is really important. I think if I were to put something in the, in the chat, it'd be togetherness. Togetherness because if you aren't together, you will never succeed as a whole. Snaps. Snaps. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, so when we're, when we're thinking about all of these, yes, keep these coming. Truth creates a true, a true need for community and trust. When we're thinking about all of these, um, they all, it's all a recipe for the elements of trust. Um, I don't know if you all have heard time is money, but when we think about time is money, Justin Patton wants us to switch our mindset. And what he says is, time is not money, trust is money and in life and relationships trust is the cornerstone to everything um and with when we think about our communities whether you're on your campus whether you are in your in your hometown whether it is actually looking and sitting back and looking at student athlete environment as a whole it is this community and this feeling of hey i've got your back and you will have mine and that is priceless that is the currency for us to come together it's the currency for us to trust one another when we think about that. Um, and when we think about our national racism wound, it is wide open right now. Um, let's pause and think about how important do you think trust is to Black Americans right now? It's very important. It's very important to people who have been directly impacted by the current and heightened racial um, inequality and injustices um, right now. So just think about that. Think about how trust um, is important in our relationships and how important it is in the currency of our community. For folks who are fans of literature, um, you'll remember Ralph Ellison's book, The Invisible Man. 
in the idea of the invisible man. This, this is a quote from the invisible man. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. And so this could, while he was speaking specifically about the black experience in America, if you think from, from an intersectionality standpoint or from any social justice issue, any identity issue that's not based on membership of a dominant group, this would apply, this idea of not being seen. And so as we think about in a, in a racial context specifically, um, black Americans often wonder about their white counterparts. Do you see me? Do you really see me, my humanity? Do you hear me and hear what I have to say about my experience? Does what I have to say about my experience ring true to you or, or valid? And then finally, does my life matter? Um, does any of this matter? And it, as you think about what Sable just said about trust, it being money, really trust is the only currency that matters right now. Trust is the only currency that matters because until we see the humanity in one another, it's really hard to make progress, like real sustainable social justice progress. And so part of that, the, the trust and truth association is gonna be really critical. And so as you think about you know, what Ellison really warned us about was stripping the humanity of people, no matter what the identity might be that you have an issue with. And as we consider that, let's take a look at what Justin Patton offered these four concept, uh, concepts of trust, this first one being truth. And as you see this photo, think about truth from, from the idea of our lens, right? So each of us is uh, the compilation of our life experiences. All the things we've done, the places we've uh, grown up and lived, the people who've raised us, loved us, uh, abused us, whatever the case, is may, whatever the case may be, um, that collection of life experiences forms our truth. And if, if you wouldn't mind sharing with each other and us to the extent that you're comfortable, hey, what are, what are the life experiences? What are some of the experiences that make up your truth in the lens through which you see the world? Um, Brent, thank you. Being biracial, certainly your, your racial identity. Uh, being the youngest sibling, Justin, thank you. Sin, being black, absolutely. Ben talks about family relations. Yes, thank you. Being ve vegan, thank you. Caitlin, the child being a child of immigrants. Um, yes, people talk, talking about racial identities, religious affiliations. Sure, being a female athlete. Yeah, absolutely. Empathy, Mariah, thank you. Yeah, yeah being Christian. Like, so talking again about your religious affiliation or identity. Uh, being a woman and being quote unquote foreign. Uh, being a Christian. Thank you, Brenton. The important piece we want you to think about when we consider truth as this core aspect of trust, understand that our truth individually is not the only truth or it's not the truth, it's our truth. So the angle, the lens through which we see the world is informed by all of our experiences. Our responsibility as people who wanna lead um, and wanna get people to think about social injustices is to open ourselves up and empathize with somebody else's truth. Yeah, so the second core element of trust is transparency. Some of you may have seen this iceberg image, whether it's on the gram, I know I've seen it on the gram a bunch of times, um, different topics, knowing what's on the surface and then also underneath the waterline that you cannot see. So it might be familiar, but today we're gonna talk about it um, when it comes to transparency in our relationship and building trust. It's explaining what is below the, the, the waterline. So when we, when we sit back and we think about this, when we know the full story and when we know what's under the waterline and we trust each other and their intentions and we understand where they're coming from, that can put us at ease. That is the, the mend and the bridge to our relationships. So let's sit back and think about a social interaction that you've had. Maybe you're in the locker room um, and you have a teammate and your gut is telling you that they're withholding information from you and they're only giving you that surface level um, interaction and communication. How does it feel when things are withheld from you? How does it feel when information is withheld from you? Betrayed? Uneasy? Frustrating? Yes, sad, anxious, mm -hmm. trust is broken, belittling? Annoying? <laughs> yeah, I, I get really annoyed. If I feel like someone is withholding information from me, I'm really irritated and I'm not fun to be around when I'm irritated. Hurt, uncomfortable, 
Bothersome, frustrating, loss of trust, yes. Thank you for all of these responses. Untrusted, worried, it makes me want to withhold my information. Isabel, thank you for sharing that. And that brings us to the quote that's on the screen, going back to our girl, Brene Brown. She says, when people don't have all of the information, they fill the gaps with fear. When we don't have all of the information, we fill our gaps with fear. So let's consider in our nation right now, what narratives are being reinforced around racial injustice because we don't know the full story and we're not acknowledging that other, someone else has a different lens. What is getting re reinforced because we're only looking at what's on the surface and we don't acknowledge that there's a whole story underneath the iceberg image, right? right? When people are scared, when people are angry, when people don't know the whole story, they're confused, they're humiliated, they fill those gaps with fear. And when we act out of fear, it's very, very unlikely that we have positive results. So all of this ties into trust. And Jeff is gonna to talk to us about TACT. Yeah, thanks, Sable. So, so the next one is, is TACT, as Sable mentioned. And TACT, uh, for, for Justin and for us, really refers to the intensity with which you show up to a given situation. And so another way to think about that is emotional intelligence. And are you using some emotional intelligent leadership as you approach conflictual situations? Um, when you feel the temperature rising in you, when, somebody, when something is really important to you, especially something like a social justice topic, and you hear somebody disparaging it or making light of it, boy, your, your ability to regulate in that situation, to press the emotional pause button, is gonna be really critical for you to be able to have some success. Looks like 75% um, of us agree or strongly agree that our presence makes it safe. Um, nobody strongly disagrees. 21% uh, of us are unsure and a small percentage of us disagree with this statement. And so the, the challenge we would lay before you is to really check in with people about this um, and check in in a way that doesn't um, uh, force somebody to say yes. So make sure you don't say something like, yeah, you can come talk to me about these type of things, right? Because you're, you're asking for a certain answer when you do that. Uh, but if you can engage people that you really trust to tell, to tell you, just like Raphael is saying, um, I think that's gonna be really helpful. It's gonna help you achieve your goals in the longer run you know, of what we're really trying to get at. So as you consider this, um, we want you to think about, given that most of you talked about being able to make it safe, now we wanna give you a, a second to go back in, into the chat and share with us and each other, what are some of the things you do that make it safe? Because this doesn't happen by accident. So what do you do to make sure you're regulating your emotions in a way that it makes safe for people to come talk to you. Vocalize, I won't judge instantly. I'm actively listening, really important. Checking my bias, man, it's really, it's hard to know sometime. Yep, trying not to pass judgment, not being judgmental, a lot of people said. Keeping things confidential. Yeah, op staying open-minded, really important. All of this, and the act of listening, not gaslighting, oh, that's really important too. Yeah, having an open mind. Absolutely. Coming from a caring perspective and a positive mindset. All these things are skills that we can learn. So you, if you're seeing these and thinking, wow, I don't do any of that well, how can I do this? You can learn to do this. It's just a matter of your uh, uh, conviction and commitment to getting better. Um, so these are some great uh, suggestions of skills. And so that, with that being said, let's think about tact as we move into the last of these four characteristics of togetherness. When we think about togetherness, this is really the ability to put our relationships before ourselves. So on the screen, you'll see there is our traditional piggy, piggy bank and the needle is on E. And this can reflect some of our relationships. And Dr. Stephen Covey, who's the author of Seven, um, Habits, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talks about emotional bank accounts and our need to make emotional investments within our relationships. So when we talk about emotional investments, it's stopping and listening to each other. It's having empathy. It's understanding when to listen and when to speak up and when to have a voice. Well, let's think about what happens to relationships when you have not made emotional deposits in them. What happens to our relationships when we have not made these emotional deposits? Thanks, Raphael, and nice and simple. <laughs> They are surface, that's awesome. Um, Peyton says they fall apart. 
Isabella says they don't grow. Exactly. We don't grow. They stay stagnant. I think someone says when someone withholds information from them earlier, then that means that they want to withhold information as well. So they don't grow. Sarah says insecure. Lack of transparency. Exactly. We talked about that um, before. Sarah says no space to express. Um, let's think about how that feels when we don't feel like we have the space to express ourselves. We feel silent. Um, and continue to, to have conversation in the chat. And I want to ask, how likely is it that we will be able to have honest conversations on topics like racism if we're not building trust? How likely is it that we'll be able to have these difficult conversations, which is why we're here today, if we do not have this trust? Not at all. Barely, it's impossible, Patricia says. Samantha says, not learning and not looking forward to getting better. Thank you. Not likely. It's not likely. It is very not likely if we're not building the foundation of trust, if we're not doing it together, um, and we're not showing up and wanting to listen to the full story, we're not going to be able to build the trust to have relationships, to have honest conversations, be vulnerable, show up, take off our masks in order to move forward. Um, and if any of these crucial elements are broken, compromised, fractured, if any of them are broken, we have to invest in repairing them. And lastly, I'll just add this, you don't have to be best friends. <laughs> you don't have to be best friends to build relationships. You don't have to be biffles, don't have to be following each other on the gram, any of that type of stuff to do these things. It is all about the self-assessment and the self-awareness to want to get better in each bucket um, to build trust. So now we're gonna transition into the baseline understanding of racism in the current turmoil in our nation. Thanks, Sable. And we want to take a look at it as we looked at this foundation around vulnerability and then trust and understanding that, that without those, it's going to be really hard to get traction in any, one, any of the social justice, justice topics, whether it's racism, sexism, heterosexism, whatever, the, whatever the, the, the issue you want to cover, you're not going to be able to engage with somebody in a way that's productive and meaningful if you haven't established that type of trust. Um, to be able to disagree. Um, another thing that's going to be important is understanding the power and influence of privilege, both in the way you are heard or not heard, depending on which identity groups we belong to. Now, this is one of the huge inequities um, and injustices of our culture, but it's important to understand and recognize that this is the system under which we're all operating, so we understand how to navigate. And so as you think about this question that's on the screen, around privilege, what we'd like you to do is if you could go to the chat and just share with us, as you think about privilege, what comes to your mind? What are the words that come to your mind when you talk about privilege? It getting away with things, blind, white, advantage, ignorance, systemic inequality, yeah, thank you, a step up, extra opportunities, absolutely power, un uh, unfair, ignorance, a uh, lack of empath empathy, Absolutely, colorism. Yeah, several people mentioned white specifically, having something but not realizing it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, blinders, oftentimes having a head start. Those with more equity. Yes, yeah, cer certainly social equity and cultural equity uh, in a in a uh, culture, uh, as Crystal saying, that's built on privilege in many ways. And so we want to take a moment and take a look at. We have the CO2 symbol that's on the screen. And as you think about connecting that to privilege, one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it through this lens is the idea of uh, some of the composition of CO2. And so it's, I'm sure there are those of you on the call who know much more about this substance than me. Uh, but what I do know is you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, but it's toxic and it will kill us. And if you think about the components of privilege and those of us as somebody like me who benefits from several categories of privilege, I'm usually the last person to know I have that privilege. Unless I've gone out of my way to learn about it or I have friends that have helped me see this, uh, I'm usually, if I'm benefiting from privilege, I've benefited from that privilege for most of my life in most of the categories. Uh, and I'm usually the last one to know that I have it. So as you consider this idea of being the last to know, this is part of the education process and to understand if it's something that somebody has had their whole life and somebody tells them it's special and unique to them based on a certain category, 
think about what the reaction from that person is going to be. Generally, probably not very positive. Um, and as Alex is saying, oftentimes we just don't see it. Um, so as you consider, Peggy McIntosh was one of the early researchers and writers around privilege, especially as it relates to race-based privilege. And so she wrote a lot about white privilege. And here's a quote from Peggy. Privilege exists when one group has something of value that is denied to others simply because of groups they belong to, rather than because of anything they've done or failed to do. And here's the important piece we wanna share about privilege, is that it, it's about group membership, not individuality, right? So you're either gonna be granted privilege or denied access to this privilege, simply based on a, a, a category that has been created and that we've been put in. And so as you consider that, we wanna uh, think about this idea of a privilege, being part of a privilege category means that you did not have to work hard for your accomplishments. So let's say, for instance, racially, me being a part of the white racial category, a privilege category, means that I did not have to work hard for my accomplishments. Do you agree, disagree, or unsure? So here's what we said. 81% uh, of us disagreed, 10% agreed, and 9% of us were unsure. So overwhelmingly, people have disagreed with this. And what, I, what we want you to consider is, why is that important to ask or think about, this idea of, uh, privilege, meaning people didn't have to work hard. It's important to understand that you could work really hard, you could have a lot of struggle in your life, and you could have had to sacrifice a ton, and you still could benefit from privilege. I think this is the, the hardest part for those of us who benefit from privilege in multiple categories, to accept without being defensive. Because we think of, we have the yeah but response. Yeah but. You don't understand how hard I've had to work. You don't understand how poor we were coming up. Um, that was me. That was my family. You know, poor white family, a really rough scrabble neighborhood. I want to share a brief story with you. As you think about uh, this, I am uh, 16 years old. I just get my driver's license and my pops agrees to let me take the family blazer. Right? So this is, well, I'm not going to say when this was because, you know, you'll probably think I'm 500 years old. This was, this was a long time ago. So think about this, you just get your license, you're granted the, the family vehicle, if that, if that is available to you at your, in your household, what's the first thing you're gonna do? So I call my friends. As I call my friends, um, five of my teammates or so, I think it was about five of my teammates were available to come. It just so happened that all my teammates and friends who were available to come were all black. So it's me, the driver, it's white kid, a bunch of my black friends, teammates in the car. We're driving around, having a good time. All of a sudden, flashing lights behind us. I'm panicking, really start thinking about my dad and what he's going to say to me and how I'm never going to get to drive a family car again. Um, so police officer comes up, knocks on the window, um, asks me to get out of the car. We walk back to the back of the blazer, and I'm still panicking. And then I notice that the officer is not looking at me. He's talking to me, but he's looking in the vehicle. He's looking at my teammates and he's, you know, glances over me, looking at my teammates. And then he finally says, Are you okay, son? And I'm shocked. I'm thinking, what, what do you mean? Am I okay? And he, he points into the vehicle and says, are you okay? And the inference was obvious, right? He was asking whether I'd been carjacked because there's no way somebody who's white could be friends with somebody who's black, apparently. Right. So I, he, we clear that up. I get back in the, the blazer. I tell my teammates, do you think any one of them were surprised? That would be no. The only one surprised was the white kid. And so I think about that. That was such a light bulb moment for me as a 16 year old. We grew up in this, we lived and grew up in the same neighborhood. We went to the same high school, played on the same team and we're all friends. But my experience of being somebody who was white was vastly different than both all my friends' experience being black. And so as you think about that, that, that certainly, that was a long time ago, but sadly, nothing has really changed, right, in the way our culture profiles and deals with people based on membership of certain categories. Um, so I share that with you because for me, that was a transformative moment to think about while wow, my experience being somebody who's white is vastly different than all my friends' experience. And as we consider that, it's important for us to remember not to be defensive, 
about the fact that we have membership in a privileged category, but to think about how can I, if I understand this, how then can I utilize this to be an advocate for an ally of people who don't have the privilege I benefit from? Because that's the important next piece of it. There are so many different types of privileges. Today we've been talking about the privilege of race and when it comes to social justice um, and just the importance of understanding that it's it's the head start, right? It is the, the fact that privilege is always at someone else's expense. It's always at a, exact at a cost. And also everything that's done to maintain it or receive it results in suffering and deprivation for someone. So when we think about privilege, it's not at fault of the individual, but just like Jeff said, it's part of the group membership and acknowledging that you have it and acknowledging that that on the other side of the coin, if you are at the right side or the, the beneficial side of privilege, the other side of the coin, it's always at a cost to someone. And we start with the acknowledgement of it. So when we think about privilege and having a conversation, a lot of times people become defensive and then we get this divide. We get, um, we get well, I don't understand why we have to talk about privilege and some people are on defense, but now we're gonna talk about how do we start the conversation to make sure that we come together and have trust with togetherness, but also so that we can create a community to where we can have this conversation to move forward. Mayor, we all have some form of privilege, thank you. It is very multifaceted, Harry. Yes, learning from Instagram stories, social media. Um, personally, I have learned from a lot of Instagram stories and social media, and we can be very aware of who we're following and making sure um, it's credible and consistent information, absolutely. Vocalizing personal stories, thank you. Speaking with kindness and awareness. This is really important to be very, very direct, but also have those emotional deposits of kindness and awareness, absolutely. Addressing your own privilege, discussing how we can use our privilege to help one another. This is very important in, the, in our conversations. Being open to new concepts. Yes, there is not one way to do something. There's not one way to create change. You have to be open to something new and what fits at um, a school in the West Coast might not fit at a school on the East Coast. There are different cultures within departments and, and environments, absolutely. Vulnerability can allow you to see other privilege you might not have. Thank you for sharing that. But as we talk about privilege today, we're just gonna wrap it up and Jeff is gonna wrap us up with one more quote that we're gonna talk about here um, about privilege. Thank you, Sable. And so this uh, is a, uh, a tweet that we'll share about uh, race-based privilege or white privilege. Uh, white privilege doesn't mean your life hasn't been hard. It means that your skin color isn't one of the things making it harder. Um, just as kind of like, like uh, uh, the end of our sentence here and talking about privilege as it relates to one aspect. And, and to, be, to be sure, race is just one category of privilege. Um, but it's one, one of the, it's an important piece, especially in our time right now. Um, and so as people are, are struggling with thinking about privilege, this is, this is one of the pieces that we think are really important. So just let's consider that. And as we pivoted away from thinking about privilege, remember what we talked about when we started talking about privilege just a few minutes ago, understanding these different categories of privilege will also help you understand maybe some of the roadblocks or open doors you may be receiving when you try to advocate for some of these issues. Because, the, because these categories are real of privilege, it also means the doors may be open to me that are not open to Sable, just based on the, the categories we belong to. And this is where finding allies and people can help amplify our voices and, and uh, support us is gonna be really important. Um, if, if you're gonna topple a system, you have to really be, be strategic in ways you wanna do that. And so as you consider some of the preparations you, you may go through um, in preparing for some of these conversations, here's, we, we pr provide a list here just for you to think about as you're getting ready for this, what might be important for you to consider. So we invite you to take a moment here and just read through the list um, of these eight things. Um, this first one, we'll, we'll read a couple as we think about this. First, start with me. Always remember, like the, the one thing you can control is you. You can't control how somebody's going to respond to uh, what you're saying, what you're advocating for, who you're with. But you can control how, how you present yourself, how you show up, and how you react. 
Um, we're not going to read through every one of them. We'll, we'll ask you to just read through them as you go. Feel free to take a screenshot or a picture of this from your home as well. Um, so you can think about these. There's a few that we think is important. The idea of leading with empathy and number three is really important too. That shame is not really an effective tool for social justice. It's a tool of cruelty. It's a tool of violence. It's a tool of abuse. Um, so the idea is if we can lead with empathy, we're going to be a much better stead as we move through. But we want you to think about these. Is it Part of this is having some good positive self-talk before you go into some of these courageous conversations and understanding that, man, the outcome may not be what I want it to be, but these are the things I'm really trying to show up for. Um, the idea of number six, meeting people where they are, is really important as well. Um, the whole idea of us having these conflicts is that we're not all at the same place. So always think about this. And remember, we all need allies. Let's try not to do it by ourselves when we can um, hopefully be recruiting other people to try to help us in this vein as well. So hopefully you've all had a chance to read through them now. Would you mind sharing in the chat with us uh, which one of these resonates with you? Um, as you think about this and you think about preparing to try to amplify someone's voice or a cause, La Caitlin, thank you, number eight, the idea of social justice is actually work. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Sarah, doing it with others. Yeah, meeting people where they are. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Absolutely. Yeah, listening to understand, leading with empathy. Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Caitlin, listening to understand. Ashley talks about using self-awareness. So much of this all com comes back to uh, our ability to be self-aware um, and to listen and have allies. So thank you. So use this as a resource to help you. Um, and, um, and consider it as you go. So one of the things we want to do is at least have a, a pause point for a moment. So if, if nothing else, we can capture these in the chat, but we want to have an opportunity for at least some questions as you think about this, understanding this is the first one of the series that the NCA is putting on for everyone, uh, but to consider what questions you may have at this point. Um, so even if we don't get a chance to respond to them all here tonight, um, we can save them in the chat. So hopefully we can respond to them more broadly um, in a public sense. We have a question from Brenton Duval. Um, my question was, I believe number eight, it said um, build up your endurance so then you can continue to work um, as, through social justice. Um, what are some practical ways that we can build up our endurance um, during this time so we don't get tired or um, worn out by this um, ongoing um, injustice. I think that's I think that's a really good point. And just understanding that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, this is something that we're currently leading our some of our student athlete leaders on campus, um, making sure that your cup is full and that you're taking care of yourself first. That means getting sleep. That means understanding how much social media intake you can handle or that's necessary. For me personally, I have to do the same thing of having endurance as an administrator and making sure like, hey, tonight I need to put my phone down, read a book or decompress um, just to show up the next day. Um, so you have to figure out what works for you. It's individual. Some people can, can be into it and be 100% full every single day and every minute. But for me, I know personally, and some of, some of my student athletes on campus have to make sure they, they take that personal time in order to show up and be 100%. Change is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be over time. So you have to make sure you're taking care of yourself. The idea of self-care, as Sable was saying, is so critical here. And that's why it's an endurance piece. You know, just like me, if you think about the analogy of, as athletes, how we work up, work out and build up endurance in our muscles, um, strength and endurance, no matter what sport or event it is, we're not as good in day one as we are, you know, mid-season form and understand this is the same. And for folks who are not used to advocating or talking or speaking on social justice issues, it can be really frustrating because you can see somebody who just clearly does not think the anywhere near the way you do. Um, and that energy expenditure on people like that make it really, really hard. Um, so yeah, thank you, Sable, for, for your response. And Brenton, thank you for the question. Um, and there's, there's plenty of good questions on here. I see Isabella had a question um, that a couple of people are kind of pointing to. 
how, sh how should white student athletes approach these issues to ensure we don't minimize the voices of our black student athlete peers? Yeah, great question. Um, and as you think about this, the idea of allyship is really important. Um, and the, the, um, you wanna make sure you're not falling for being a trendy, trendy ally. Like, so um, I'm gonna go to the Black Lives Matter rally so I can take pictures of myself there because it's cool to be there right now. Or I'm gonna uh, kind of hashtag BLM all over my social, but that's not really what I'm about as a person. And so what you wanna do is really find out ways that you can amplify the voices and profile of black student athletes um, and not speak for them, right? So, you know, asking, hey, how can I be supportive? How can I do all the, you know, kind of behind the scenes work to make sure your voice is gonna be amplified and not mine um, and understand, hey, if I have privilege as a, as a white student athlete, what can I do to use my privilege to make sure other people are heard? Um, so really good question. And I would ask, uh, following up on what Isabella is saying, everybody to look into allyship and ways to be a good ally and not take over for people who belong to quote unquote marginalized groups. Sable and I both are happy to continue conversations with any of you and all of you and uh, be helpful in any way that we can as we think about this, um, as we think about trying to help you move forward. And the last thing we wanna show you from our standpoint is this idea of understanding that there's gonna be so many people who are gonna to try to tell you it can't be done as you go about trying to do what you wanna do. Um, and re this quote from Muhammad Ali, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it is an opinion. And so the idea of let, let's think about the power all of us have to change the world and what are the ways that we can execute that within our circles. Um, so thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you, Jeff, I appreciate it. All right, so as Jeff mentioned, there's a, couple, there's a lot of questions in the chat that we still have unanswered. So yes, we are take, taking note of those questions so that we can follow up with you all. One of those things as well from the questions are the three other sessions that we still have on activism, allyship, and action. So next week we will have activism that will talk about the different forms of activism. What is activism? How do I get involved? And with that in particular, um, you'll learn some things you can sign petitions, educate, it's not always being on the front line. So I encourage you all to join us on the next call. So the other thing that I wanted to mention to you all that I took away from this is I was listening to a podcast this week and I want to share something that they said. So the podcast was talking about Harriet Tubman and what they called the Tubman Doctrine, right? And there's four parts of this doctrine, doctrine that they kind of created, right? And talking about what she did. But the first step, is start walking for yourself. Harriet Tubman set out on her walk by herself, her even when her brothers and her husband just said they weren't gonna go with her. So she had no, excuse, no excuses and just went out on the walk for herself. The second part is come back and get your people, right? Harriet Tubman made it to freedom and she came back to free other people. So take this education, right? encourage your teammates, encourage your friends, your families to be educated with you. Come back and get them. The third part is rally your allies, right? How can you be an ally, but also who's not included in the conversation that needs to be in the conversation? Who can also help you during this? Harriet Tubman took full advantage of her, the allies that she gained along the way. And the fourth and final step is to find joy. So through all of this as well, find joy in educating yourself, helping others, and continuing to grow. So I thank you all for your engagement tonight. The chat was going crazy and I really appreciate it. So many good nuggets from both our speakers, but from you all as well. I thank you for your openness and your willingness to learn. And again, I encourage you to take advantage of the other three sessions that we have and bring some other people with you next time as well. So I thank you again for your time and I hope you all have a good rest of your day.